Good afternoon. If you're joining our webinar, uh, uh, we're just going to let people uh, through the uh, entry door uh, and as they build up, uh, we'll get started in just a few moments. Okay, I think we'll uh, get started. I'm sure a few people will join us as we uh, uh, carry on uh, over the next few minutes, but uh, the room is uh, uh, full and bursting. So uh, welcome to you to today's uh, webinar focused on the Windsor Framework and the more recently negotiated command paper that's resulted in the reconvening of the Northern Ireland Assembly and its institutions, which is a good thing. In the next hour or so, we're going to explore the critical role this framework plays in shaping trade and the economic relationships within the United Kingdom, as well as the opportunities for businesses to trade in and out of uh, Northern Ireland. In recent months, the UK government uh, released a command paper uh, outlining its vision for the internal market, emphasising the importance of maintaining seamless trade and regulatory alignment among the UK's constituent nations. And the, the paper is a significant touchstone in our discussion today. Now, it's the foundation for ensuring the free flow of goods, services and investments across England, Scotland, Ireland, and uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, however, it's also important to acknowledge it's been controversial. It's been hard uh, at one uh, command paper that, that that changes the Windsor framework in, in some ways, and we're going to investigate what those are uh, today. So I'm thrilled to introduce our two distinguished speakers who's, who are going to guide us through today's discussion. Firstly, we have uh, Shankar Singham, who's CEO of Competere, and whose expertise in international trade and regulatory affairs are going to offer, I think, valuable insights into the intricacies of the framework and command paper. Shankar is also closely involved in the delivery of the Trade of Support Service in Northern Ireland, uh, and he is going to guide us through the practical steps that you can take to facilitate the smooth movement of goods between GB and NI. Joining him is my colleague, William Bain, Head of Trade Policy at the British Chambers of Commerce, whose deep understanding of how this is landing with businesses will pro provide us with, I think, invaluable perspectives and the practical implications of the internal market for traders across the UK. William will also discuss some of the detail within the command paper and the establishment of new institutions to create the environment uh, uh, for improved trade between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Um, as we explore the framework and the command paper, I, explore, I, I encourage you to engage actively Share your perspectives uh, and your comments and contribute to the conversation. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please use that, not the chat function, the Q&A function, and we'll aim to get to as many of your questions and observations as we can today. So we will have, I hope, plenty of time for Q&A. By tomorrow, we're going to share a link to a video of the session as well as copies of any uh, slides that you see, so you don't need to screenshot them. So today, uh, together, let's gain a deeper understanding of the Windsor Framework, the command paper, and its significance for the future of trade in the United Kingdom. Uh, thanks for joining us. So we'll get going, uh, and I'll pass over to you, Shankar. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Liam. Um, and um, we have a, a small... It's, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint, so I, I will hasten to add. Um, uh, but we have a small um, set of slides or a couple of slides. Um, uh, and first of all, thank you very much, Liam, for um, the invitation from the British Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, we in the Trader Support Service have been very much engaged with Northern Ireland uh, entities and Northern Ireland uh, receivers of goods. Uh, we, we very much want to broaden that engagement. Um, half of our TSS traders are, in fact, 
people registered on TSS, I think more or less half are GB firms. So um, we absolutely want to reach out to GB suppliers as well. Uh, and I think um, the, the takeaways from, from this session or the things that I'm going to sort of talk about, um, the, the, the a couple of takeaways. One is there's a lot of information. This is a short, um, uh, a short seminar, but there is a lot of information on the Windsor framework um, and, um, uh, and the, the processes um, that traders need to use in order to benefit from the Windsor framework facilitations on the Northern Ireland Customs Trade Academy website, which is the NICTA website. So that is www.nicustomstradeacademy.co.uk. And we can send you that um, information uh, after this uh, event. Um, but please, please use that as a resource. It, it's where TSS puts all of all of our uh, guidance and, and, and training. The other sort of big takeaway um, from this that we we want people to, um, uh, to to take away from this event is the need for GB. If you're a GB supplier, um, uh, the need for you to liaise, talk to uh, your Northern Ireland receivers, um, and to understand the supply chain, and to and to talk also to the hauliers who are moving goods back and forth between GB and Northern Ireland, because it's that supply chain. Different elements of that supply chain need to do different things in order to take full advantage um, of the Windsor framework. And so um, uh, th there are things that GB suppliers need to do to, to sort of collaborate, cooperate with their Northern Ireland receivers. Um, uh, if you are um, uh, trading on 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 uh, delivered uh, duty paid terms, DDP terms, then you are the importer of record as a GB supplier, and you will have to do a lot of the processes um, that 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 are that are necessary. And so, it's important for you to understand them and to understand what are the facilitations and how you take full advantage. So, with that, let me let me go into a couple of slides um, uh, before uh, before we go to the next slide. Um, just a bit of context. So the Windsor framework, um, essentially what it does is it prov provides uh, a more simplified process. And I'm going to be talking mainly about customs, but there are obviously DEFRA schemes um, under the Windsor framework that are, are already operational today. Um, but it provides a simplified process for moving goods from GB to Northern Ireland. And that simplified process will be um, effective from the end of September of this year, which is not very far away. Um, and, and, uh, and that will mean that less information will be required from traders in order to move goods from GB to Northern Ireland than is currently the case. Um, the heart of the, the customs simplifications uh, is the UK internal market scheme. And I'm going to spend my my time here dwelling a bit more on this because uh, this is the sort of entry level in order to get all of the advantages of those movements inside the UK internal market. Um, uh, the simplified process, all of the benefits um, of, of the Windsor framework are, uh, we, we, we call them green lane benefits before the command paper that Liam you referred to, uh, it is now uh, under a sort of big shopping basket, which is the UK internal market system, which is all of those facilitations, all of those benefits, if you're moving goods basically inside the UK internal market. So the heart of this, um, from a customer's perspective, is the UK internal market scheme, the, so the so-called UKIMS scheme. Um, what does the, the UKIMS scheme entitle you to get? So if we go to the next slide... Um, essentially, and, and this slide and, and others are, are available, I, I would say, I should say on the Northern Iron Customs Trade Academy, the NICTA website that I mentioned before, there's also a Windsor Framework introduction set of slides that you can look at on the, uh, NICTA website. The benefits of UKIMS, first of all, there are financial benefits that start, that, that are already in effect, started in September of, of, of last year. And those financial benefits are essentially a, a rise uh, from goods moving not at risk 
um, of moving into the EU. In other words, the internal market UK movements. Prior to the Windsor framework, this, this was a scheme called the UK Trader Scheme. It meant that there was no duty if you were entering Northern Ireland from free circulation in Great Britain. Uh, and a UK duty would be applicable if you're entering Northern Ireland from outside the EU in the UK. Um, uh, and if you're not in free circulation, UK duty if entering Northern Ireland from GB uh, and the goods are not in free circulation. Um, the difference between the UKIM scheme with regard to financial fiscal benefits and the old UK trader scheme is that the UKIM scheme is broader. It allows more people to benefit. There are certain restrictions from the UK trader scheme, such as people having to be um, to have facilities um, in Northern Ireland that have been broadened under the UK UKIM's scheme. The, under the UK Internal Market Scheme. And that broadening is very relevant to GB suppliers because if you're a GB supplier and you're on DDP terms, you can be registered and you should be registered on UKIMS in order to take full advantage of the fiscal benefits. Um, but if you're even if you're a GB supplier and you're not um, the, going to be the importer of record, you need to know and understand that your receiver ought to be on the UKIM scheme if they want to take advantage of the um, fiscal benefits that are applicable and available now. Uh, there are other elements of the UKIM scheme that are broader than the previous UKTS scheme. Um, uh, there, there are rules with regard to processes in Northern Ireland um, where there are exceptions for things like food and healthcare, and it's the same exceptions that applied to the previous UKTS scheme, but now, um, for everything other than food where things haven't changed, um, additionally, if you're selling to a person who is then selling into a processor, uh, they're able to take advantage of the UKIMS scheme, whereas in, in the past, if the goods was, were merely subject to processing, you lost the ability to take advantage of, 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 this, of this scheme. Point of clarification on the interaction between this and the two of the DEFRA schemes, the Northern Ireland Retail Movement Scheme and the Northern Ireland uh, Plant Health Labelling Scheme, the NIFL scheme. Uh, in, in the NERM scheme, if you're, you're, if you're a processor in Northern Ireland, you can't uh, be on the NERM scheme. So that's a slight difference from the UKIMS scheme and the, and the NERMS scheme. But under UKIMS, the, uh, the processing exception, the ability to be on the scheme, even if you're a processor, has been extended that the, um, the, um, uh, the small processor um, exception. So if, if you're a processor, but you don't satisfy any of the exceptions on food and, and so on, um, the small processor exception has been increased considerably. So that should capture more um, uh, small processes and information on that, as I say, is on the Northern Ireland Customs and Trade Academy um, website. So if you are trading, if you're a GB supplier and you're trading into uh, a processing production in Northern Ireland, you should be aware that the, these benefits have been extended and your, your receiver should be able to benefit from these um, processes. And of course, if you're a GB supplier on DDP terms, you should be able to benefit um, from these from, from the UKIMS scheme. Um, now, as I mentioned, from September 2024, uh, September of this year, there are additional process benefits. So um, if you want to access, and obviously it is no longer called the Green Lane, so it's now the UK internal market system to move goods from GB into Northern Ireland. Um, these are not subject to, to the same processes that generally applied before um, before these process benefits kick in. And essentially, it's a simplified data set. It involves commercial information, shipping information, and there is a process to ensure that the other information that's required, um, whether it's information related to the goods description, what the goods actually are, is simplified so that traders will have their own unique trader goods profile, which HMRC, HMRC is, is in the process of standing up for, 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 for traders, to enable the, the, the TGP, the trader goods profile, 
will help traders to populate the um, various databases that need to be populated in order to make these movements work. So it's a simplified data set. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Just conscious of time, I'm going to go through the, the this quite quickly. So we've got a couple of examples here that you can see you can see how it works. So if a trader imports, for example, sports clothing into Northern Ireland, you know the goods would be subject to duty if they were moving at risk of going into the EU. But if they remain in Northern Ireland, they're not at risk of moving into the EU. If you're on the UKIM scheme, if you're authorised, you 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 um, can use a particular code, the NIREM code, on your on your declaration. And you can therefore um, avoid paying any duty. Uh, if you're not UKIMS authorized um, and they're not zero rated, which means that, they're, that the tariff is not zero, um, you can't claim the NIREM. You, you'll have to pay the applicable duty. All is not lost in that case. You can still use the duty reimbursement scheme to claim any duty paid, provided you can show that your goods never left Northern Ireland. In other words, they stayed in the UK customs territory. But it's much better if you can be UKIMS authorized to be UKIMS authorized. And if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, the application form on gov.uk. Uh, we will help you in TSS if you are stuck on the on the form. Uh, uh, we can uh, we have on the Northern Ireland Customs Trade Academy uh, a walkthrough of how you fill in the the the, the form. Um, and frequently asked questions on on the UKIMS si system itself, on the UKIMS scheme itself. Um, if you're still unsure, you can always contact us, and and you've got the contact number there for um, uh, you know for information, uh, and that's the, that's the sort of front door into the TSS. And if you use that, you'll you'll get your issue resolved. If you have particularly complicated questions, they will escalate eventually. Uh, eventually up to my colleagues, senior colleagues in, in the Institute of Exports and uh, ultimately up to up to me. So um, lots of support is uh, available. Um, what I'd close by saying is um, do think about your supply chains into Northern Ireland. Think about, you know, who you're selling to, uh, who you'd like to sell to, who the haulier is who's moving the goods, and think about the, that supply chain. Uh, we're very happy to walk supply chains through the end-to-end -end journey and to pick up the um, interaction between the customs process simplifications, the NERM simplifications, the NIFL simplifications, and to sort of give you that end-to-end -end journey so that you can determine, once you see the end-to-end -end journey, um, who should do what in your in your process who should enter what data and when they should enter the data there may be there's lots of optionality here if you want to take advantage of the pre-movement information that would be provided under the under 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 the um ukim's uh, system um so that you don't have to do anything after the goods enter northern ireland right now traders will be doing supplementary declarations if you don't want to do that, there is a way for you not to do that. If it is better for you on your business model to use a process where you essentially use the simplified process after the event, if that's easier for you, then you can do that. Um, and we can walk you through that process. So I think it's quite useful for us to do that end-to-end -end journey with you so that um, you can make those decisions based on your own um, business models. But I, what I will say is there's a lot of optionality here and you need to use the time between now and the end of September to figure out, you know, what is the best way that I can uh, take advantage uh, of these facilitations. And I think once they are in place and once people sort of understand them, they will find it a much easier process than than than, than is the current process of moving goods from GB into into Northern Ireland. So I'll pause there. I know that I'm sure there will be questions, but. Um, well, just not just on that, Shankar. The questions have started coming in. I'd encourage people to use the Q and A function if you uh, familiarise yourself with that. It's at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many of those questions uh, shortly. Just for clarity, Shankar, um, the, the uh, people might be thinking, well, what does this service cost? But uh, it's a free service, free, isn't it? Free, 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 free at point of use. So um, free at the point of use. Uh, Government funded. Free at the point of use. And uh, many traders over the course of the last few years have used that service. Uh, and benefited from it. 
Uh, and uh, just to make it clear to people in GB, it's available for you too. It's not mm -hmm. just for uh, uh, businesses uh, based in Northern Ireland. So thanks yeah. for that, uh, Shanka. That's useful uh, uh, information. And uh, if people are uh, uh, not clear, we can make it clearer through the Q&A. Uh, and uh, you've given some good, good signposting there to resources that we'll share with everyone uh, af after this session. So turning to my colleague, William Bain. Uh, William. Over to you. Thank you, Liam. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, you know, it feels like quite a long time we've been discussing um, you know, GB to NI trade and all the various twists and turns. Um, I'm sure we remember uh, going back all the way to sort of 2017 and some of the developments then. But I think the advantage of the Windsor Framework which was put in place last year, is it creates a dynamic which the overall agreement can be more flexibly and pragmatically implemented and in a way which um, sort of meets the consent really of all uh, the stakeholders. And I think it's very interesting that uh, since the publication of the command paper at the end of January, and the making of the, the two new statutory instruments, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, um, on the 1st of February, I think we have not had any ructions in terms of the relationship between the UK and the EU. We have had a sort of widespread acceptance um, in Northern Ireland and beyond that uh, you know, these recent changes are, are fine, that they don't create any problems. And I think that is showing that the Windsor framework is settling down. Um, and some of the issues and concerns have been proven to be addressed, uh, but also the fundamental nature of it is, is still there. And of course, if we go back to first principles, um, the Windsor framework is the, the set of legal decisions um, which ensures that there is no hard border uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So, of course, it ensures that Northern Ireland has access on quite a privileged basis to the EU single market in relation to goods. Um, and that has all kinds of implications in terms of it being somewhat easier for Northern Ireland firms to trade with EU firms on things like VAT terms uh, without requirement for SPS. Um, controls all of these aspects. Um, but what it also does is ensure that the UK is a full part of the UK internal market. And this is a bit of a new legal creation. Uh, it was maybe a maybe somewhat of a mystery to people before 2020 that there was such a thing as a UK internal market. And legislation that year um, put two really important principles across the four nations of the UK. One, um, the non-discrimination principle, uh, that goods should not be refused because they uh, come from another part of the United Kingdom, um, and also the mutual recognition principle as well. And these two principles are supervised by an office of the internal market, uh, which is based in the Competition and Markets Authority. And it's very worthwhile engaging, in, and we do engage with them, um, in terms of the guidance that they put out, the, the monitoring and enforcement role that they have. And so the, 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 the role of the, uh, the UK internal market is key, I think, to responding to some of the concerns which came uh, from some um, members of the business community and others in Northern Ireland, and in finding a practical solution that keeps everyone happy. And that's what the command paper uh, really does. So it does really two main things. One, it uh, introduces a process for independent monitoring of how the UK internal market is working. So there'll be an independent monitoring panel set up. Uh, so that's a new development. And there's also going to be a new institution called Intertrade UK set up, uh, which will be responsible for promoting um, more trade within the four nations, within the UK internal market. So these are, uh, I think, sensible developments. Um, I think they mirror what's happened in 
other internal markets globally. Um, and I think it's interesting that these have been a way to find um, you know, a, a, a meeting point to deal with the concerns. As Shankar said, you know, for about the last year since um, you know, when the Windsor framework um was produced, actually, I think it was the 28th of February 2023, and then various decisions taken in concert between the UK and the EU, various unilateral uh, declarations made by the UK as well, uh, various amendments to the original protocol and amendments to EU legislation on SPS and customs and VAT and other areas. Um, so we're, we're almost a year into it. And I think what we have seen is that broadly, it's working in a good place and it will work in a better place once these measures are in introduced. Um, I'll say just a few words about the um, uh, command paper and the two uh, statutory instruments which were passed in, in a couple of minutes. But one of the other things which um, is worth reflecting upon is of course, um, to have some of the you know, freedom of movement um, of, of product and the choice of product in Northern Ireland itself, um, it has required some changes on the part of business in other parts of the UK. And the most tangible uh, of these is, of course, the requirement for compulsory labelling for dairy and meat products, which is going to be a legal requirement uh, in the UK. This is the not for EU label. Uh, becomes a legal requirement from October of this year. And of course, the government is consulting at the moment on the terms uh, of that legislation and how it will operate. And I know it is an issue for business. Um, it's expressed to me quite regularly. Um, you know, is there any other way of doing this? You know, potentially it's going to create problems for, for export. And what the Windsor framework did is it, it left up to the UK government how the issue of labelling NNI was to be done, but it made clear that to provide the Commission with the confidence that products were just being consumed in Northern Ireland, that was the end point for consumption, they weren't going to slip into the EU single market, um, that some form of labelling was required. And what business in Northern Ireland says to us very clearly, and indeed consumer groups as well, is that if you simply labelled in Northern Ireland, then those food products would not be viable in terms of being offered by some of the companies, uh, you know, retailers and others uh, who offer those. So in order to maintain consumer choice throughout the UK internal market and to maintain those sort of UK-wide supply and sourcing chains, um, and to ensure that labelling doesn't become a political issue within Northern Ireland, having a UK-wide labelling was the better approach. And so that's the reason for this. I'm often asked by uh, business people, well, why, why has this been brought in? You know, why, what, what's the reason for it? And those are the two choices. We either label NI only, in which case the availability and choice for the NI consumer is likely to be severely affected if, 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 if that were implemented on the current supply chains. Um, or we do it in a UK-wide basis, which ensures that we can all access the same product wherever we are within the United Kingdom, but just this requirement for the additional wording on, uh, on, on the label. No doubt we'll hear over the next few months views from businesses um, across the UK about, uh, about this. It's not going to go away as an issue it's wise to think about if you are um, involved in, in trade in these agri-food products, how you're going to implement it uh, from October. But um, it's, a, it's an issue it's worth speaking to your local chamber about, and we as BCC will engage with you all the way through um, every step of the way around this. But if I turn to the command paper itself, um, what it does is really several things. Um, you know, it provides uh, some certainty um, that products moving from GB, from, sorry, from NI to GB uh, 
do, are not subject to any export processes. So, of course, we had you know, running over from the original protocol, um, the risk that there were going to have to be things like um, exit summary declarations on goods moving from NI to GB, that is really eliminated by um, the terms of, of this uh, command paper and political agreement with the EU around that. Um, we also have, I think, some additional um, guarantees for Northern Ireland in terms of no additional regulatory barriers being introduced across the Irish Sea. So both the command paper and the uh, constitutional uh, SI make clear that if uh, a UK minister is bringing forth uh, legislation, uh, then they have to make an assessment and provide an assurance that there are no additional east-west um, barriers to trade being created by that. So that is a very useful process that I think will ensure that government departments are looking at issues of intra-UK trade, um, looking at how they're implementing policies around that. And so that is a guarantee that people in, in Northern Ireland will have um, in terms of future legislation. And indeed, the other um, second piece of uh, delegated legislation extends that to all regulatory decisions. So there'll be a regulatory impact assessment in terms of the impact on the UK internal market for both um, regulations which are brought forward, but also decisions of a non-legislative character, but which are regulatory in nature which UK regulators are bringing forward and would impact upon Northern Ireland. So again, that's a significant guarantee that is now part of, of law. Um, some of the other things that the command paper does is it, um, I think, introduces more uh, guarantees again in terms of what's known as the Stormont Break. Now, the way the Stormont break operates is that for new EU uh, rules, uh, at, at the moment, the process is that uh, if there is a, a request made by Brussels to add uh, a new regulation to the list of those in Annex 3 uh, to the protocol or Annex 2, um, so to either Annex, um, then there has to be a decision made by the UK government. It's a joint decision. So the UK government has the veto. But obviously people in Northern Ireland were saying, well, where is the involvement of local politicians there? Um, you know, and what the command paper does is provide a greater detail on how MLAs in the assembly will be able to use, I mean, it's a very considerable power, not, not one to be used lightly, but are able to use the decision not to approve um, a particular piece of legislation being added uh, to the annexes in what's now the Windsor framework. So that is an important democratic control that laws that are going to affect Northern Ireland uh, will have the say, some input and say, from politicians elected by the people of Northern Ireland. So that's another important guarantee that's added to by the command paper. Um, what issues are still to be dealt with? Well, what we also have in the in the paper and um, the delegated legislation uh, implementing it is a guarantee that um, you know goods which are made in Northern Ireland, which are sufficiently processed, um, they are subject to unfettered access to the UK internal market. So they can be brought over to Great Britain without any uh, customs processes, without any, as we said, exit and entry, summary declarations. Um, so they have um, unfettered access, but that unfettered access does not apply to goods which are, let's say, simply repackaged in Northern Ireland, but were not made in Northern Ireland. Um, it doesn't apply to goods coming up you know, from the Republic, um, which are then, you know, taken through Belfast and then brought over from Belfast to uh, to, to Cairn Ryan. 
Um, so the question I think that does still have to be resolved from this is how in practice we're going to police and enforce a situation um, to, to distinguish between goods which are made in Northern Ireland and have their unfettered access and goods which are coming from the Republic and which would not be entitled uh, to that unfettered access. Um, so these are still some questions, practical questions about how, you know, in terms of uh, a sort of west to east movement of goods, uh, that that is going to um, be resolved in practice. But that question is for another day. Um, as we know also, um, in relation to um, the border target operating model, just to refer to that for one second, in terms of, of goods uh, of SPS nature coming from the Republic of Ireland to the UK, and principally it's through Holyhead, um, there are special arrangements for those um, in that uh, it is October uh, that the checks on those goods uh, would begin at UK uh, border uh, control posts. So um, I think that kind of ties in this sort of issue about goods coming from the Republic. And if you do trade with people who are sending you over goods or intermediate goods from, from the Republic, what, why is to be sh to, to make them aware of the fact uh, that they can't just reroute them through Northern Ireland and expect unfettered access? This new paper um, deals with that point, and also that there are particular arrangements um, for SPS goods coming from uh, the Republic into Great Britain from this October, and we should be wise and cognizant of all of those things. I mean, Liam, the point I would finish on generally is, however we got here, and you know there are books that have been written on this, I'm sure there'll be many, many more books written about the last seven or eight years in terms of the protocol, the Windsor framework and all of these things. But where we are is a situation where Northern Ireland really does have the best of both worlds. It has the ability to trade its goods uh, and services fully and without restriction into the UK internal market itself, which of course is still Northern Ireland's biggest market uh, for goods and services. But also in terms of goods, has this extraordinarily privileged access to the EU single market where it's able to trade friction-free uh, with all of those things. And the other decision that was made in the, the days running up to the command paper was um, a not that well-noticed decision, although we, of course, noticed it, being experts in all of these things, we hope, um, was that a decision on the usage of tariff rate quotas in UK trade deals, principally the UK's trade deal with New Zealand, uh, was made as well, a joint decision. Um, you know, the Commission published uh, legislation. UK um, was happy to uh, say yes to it and adopt it. Uh, and, and that also is the UK does make more trade deals as, as, as time goes on, I think emphasises the fact that, again, uh, you know, Northern Ireland does have access uh, to increased uh, lower duty or zero tariff products that are coming in through these agreements uh, into Northern Ireland. So that was an important point to have resolved as well. Look, we still have some issues um, um, which need to be resolved, I would say. The key one is in relation to whether the carbon border adjustment mechanism of the EU applies to Northern Ireland. Um, it's a very live one at the moment. I don't want to say too much more about that. Um, that will need to be resolved between um, the UK and the EU. Um, of course, Stormont will not have an input into that uh, discussion um, uh, as a result of there being functional institutions again. So I think there are going to be issues that come up in the future that will test the arrangements, of course. Um, but I think what we can see is that as a result of what was done last year, as a result of these new set of proposals, we have live, strong, functional relationships, much more clarity, and that in the end is what traders on both sides of the Irish Sea are really looking for. Thanks for that, William. Uh, that was uh, uh, most useful, uh, and I think compliments very well 
what Shankar had to say. Uh, the questions have been rolling in while you've been speaking. I think we'll start with some quick fire questions that might not seem like quick fire to the people are asking that are asking them, but I think will be quick fire for you. So don't feel any pressure, uh, uh, chap. So uh, about that, but let's start with uh, uh, Simon uh, uh, Larmer Brown, who says I sell goods to NI, both business to business and business to consumer, using parcel carriers. Will I need to create a commercial invoice? He's not uh, registered with UKIMS at this point in time. So I guess the question, Shankar, is should he register, given he's selling B2B and B2C, does he need a commercial invoice to move goods between N uh, to NI from, I'm presuming, GB? Yeah. Um, so so there, there will be some differences between B2C and B2B movements. B2B movements will be uh, UKIMS, uh, potentially uh, UKIMS movements. Um, so I would I would recommend that you do go ahead and, and, and register for uh, UKIMS uh, as that rolls out. Um, I, I would uh, check in with HMRC on the B2C and whether your B2B movements are indeed actually B2B movements or whether they the sort of quasi B2C movements because mm -hmm. that's po it's possible to have you know, a conversation, you might think about your business model, you might think about how you actually move goods, whether you're really operating like a um, fast parcel operator, um, in which case... Well, he's using fast parcel operators yeah. to do the movement. So, yeah, so, so I mean, I think B2B, because B2B will, there will be quite a big delta between the process for B2C and B2B. You just need to make sure that... Um, when you say B2B, you're not re you don't really mean it's it's actually really a B2C kind of movement. It may be a it may be a uh, you know, it may, it may be something that's not typically associated with consumers, but um, I would check that because uh, B2B you will need to be UKIMS um, if you want to take advantage of the of the process. Absolutely. And and it's kind of not quite related, but similar kind of question. If you only supply zero rated goods. Do we still need to register for, for UKIMS? And in your graphic, you know, you did yeah. say the, you know, Linda would have to pay the duty, uh, 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 you know, if it if it was due and not zero rated. But yeah. can you then just avoid UKIMS if your goods are always zero rated? Do you really need to bother? Well, well, I mean, certainly if the goods are zero rated, they could be zero rated because um, the common external tariff of, of the EU is zero, or they could be zero because they are subject to the TCA, the, the, the EU-UK uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, yeah. um, which provides zero. Uh, and, and so you could benefit from those things without without being on, on the UKIMS scheme. But yes. what I would say is that remember that the, the UKIM scheme uh, and the and the uh, UK internal mo market system will also include process benefits. So uh, if you are the importer of record and you want to take advantage of those process benefits, you will have to be on UKIMS in order to uh, in order to do that. So it's not just about the fiscal benefit; it's also about the process benefit. You need to think. Yeah, about. I, I think Nancy's point is that I, I guess that if if uh, Nancy Bryson it was that asked that question. If the uh, if the goods are zero rated under you know uh, our, our sort of published tariff, uh, whether we're in a free trade agreement or not, then mm -hmm. you might have process benefits. But the I think the question is, does she have to avail herself of those process no. benefits? No, no you don't. Have to. I mean, no, no one has to do no. that. Um, if no. you want to carry on doing what you've been doing previously, you're it's perfectly fine for you to do that. You, you can definitely. Uh, um, do that quick, quick one here from Claire Nicholas. Do the shipping and receiving businesses need to have an EORI number? So, you know, is that absolutely necessary? You do need or, an EORI number, yes. Yeah, they all need an EORI number is the, is the simple answer. And, and it's very easy to get one if you need yeah. one uh, to register one uh, with HMRC on gov.uk is not hard. I, I guess uh, Caroline Causeway's question is um, uh, around uh, supplementary declarations that. Mm they came in play uh, in, in terms of, of, of NI as a kind of post-Brexit thing. Are they here forever or are they going to go away? So she says, when will the completion of subdex stop? Uh, they supply UK to Northern Ireland DDP. So right. they're delivering duty paid um, uh, and therefore taking account of that. Is that something that's in the plan, Shankar, or William, have you heard anything about that uh, simplification going? So, so 
basically, if she's supplying GB to Northern Ireland DDP, she's the importer of record. Yeah. Um, if you're the importer of record and you know and you have the evidence to support the fact that your movements GB to Northern Ireland remain in the UK internal market, uh, then you should definitely apply for uh, the UKIMS scheme. Um, apply for UKIMS. Um, there is a way if you apply to if you are a UKIMS trader to not do a supplementary declaration. Uh, this is from September 24 when the when the process the the, the new process um, simplification goes into into play. Um, there is a way that you cannot do a supplementary declaration. You will have to do a you will have to basically fill in this simplified um, uh, data set before the movement of the goods from GB to Northern Ireland. So if you do that, so you'll do your normal. The haulier will do the normal things that the haulier does now. The 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 entry um, summary declaration. That will, if you do that on TSS, that will generate um, um, a uh, simplified frontier, um, uh, and you can then put in your extra, the extra information that is needed, uh, which is a little bit more than um, uh, the the simplified um, uh, declaration, um, but it's 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 twenty data fields as opposed to twenty or so data fields as opposed to eighty. Um, and 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 you can do all that and not do a supplementary declaration. On the other hand, if you feel like you don't have uh, all the data quickly enough to be able to do that, and you want to continue to do some things after the movement, you'll be able to take advantage of the simplified process after the movement as well. Uh, that's not a supplementary declaration, but it is something you might have to do after the, after the process. So it's up to you. And it's up to your internal business model and your systems to determine whether you can do that. But if you want to not have a supplementary declaration and you're a UKIMS trader and you're moving entirely in the UK internal market post September 24, that option will be available to you. Okay. So, <clears throat> and also to reiterate your offer earlier that if people want to, you know, have you help them to understand oh, the implications in their supply chain, then the Trader Support Service is ready to do that. Uh, and and to look at your specific business and uh, the requirements uh, there there therein uh, and uh, and dealt with that. And can I just ask a supplementary? You talked in your uh, in in your presentation about the trader goods profile mm. that that people could uh, avail themselves of. Is that part of the UKIM's uh, registration process, or is that a separate system? And do people need to register for that? So if you're a UKIMS trader, and, and some of these processes are being developed, um, you know, even as we speak, so um, I, I can't give you sort of chapter and verse on them right now. But what I can say with regard to the Tech Trader Goods Profile is the intention is that there will be, um, for a UKIMS trader, there will be a Trader Goods Profile that HMRC will essentially stand up. And this is precisely to help the trader deal with the, the data that the extra data that is needed to be um, put into um, UK systems in order for the movement to take place. So um, things like things related to the goods description, um, those those sorts of things, commodity codes, this sort of thing. Yeah. The trader goods profile is designed to help the trader essentially fulfil those, those those obligations. So once your trader goods profile is is up and running, and you've got all your goods that go the, the the, the, there will be data associated with those goods that the trader goods profile can pick up and uh, auto populate to some extent, so that so, so, so that reduces the less... time spent in, in producing so, and providing the data. It, exactly. So the time that you spend doing these processes should go down considerably, and and certainly if you're moving the same things over and over again, you know, yeah. from, from GB to Northern Ireland, that that time taken to to do do that should go down, you know, considerably. Good. Um, a couple of interesting questions here uh, to come forward. One from uh, Komati uh, Sundaram, who says, and this is about combined uh, at loads, if you like, it's the groupage question, sort of. So uh, Komati has got uh, some goods that stay in Northern Ireland on a truck uh, that also has goods that move into the Republic of Ireland. So do they need to complete a, complete a supplementary declaration for all the items in the load? Or will UKIMS allow them to deal with those two different types of goods, those for ROI and those for Northern Ireland? 
uh, in one uh, you know process. Yeah. So you can move mixed loads um, in the same truck. You can have a um, the 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 UKIMS uh, consignments and the non UKIMS consignments on the same truck. You don't have to segregate segregate them. Um, the UKIMS movements. Um, uh, goods will go through the process that you have chosen. So if you choose to use, and this is from September 24, you choose to use the simplified um, uh, data set, you choose to do it before the frontier, then under the GVMS system that carries the whole thing, um, yeah. you will get a specific um, a GMR for those for those things that will enable those those goods to move. Mm -hmm. and you'll do the same thing for the for the non UKIMS for the for the at risk movements as you do now for at risk movements, which is the full process simplified frontier declaration. The the ENS will generate the simplified frontier declaration on the TSS that will give you the appropriate MRN for the GVMS system that will give you the 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 GMR, and so that you will be able to move that truck. In its entirety, through the um, through through the process, through the process, and the drop process. those goods in uh, at Northern Ireland that you want to yep. drop in Northern Ireland, and then and then an import declaration as you cross into the EU. Uh, yeah, and, and, yeah. And yeah. The goods in our, yeah. Um, I mean, I I would say one thing, and this is particularly true if you've got agricultural mixed loads. I know you've got sort of norms yeah. and non norms kind of kind of things. Um, is that Clearly, if you are a, a, a truck that only has UKIMS, only has NERMS, only has things that are staying inside the UK internal market, the, um, the I suppose the difference between the groupage load and the and the and the, the simple load is that um, in the case of the simple load, or well, the all entirely UKIMS load, is that the provisions with regard to controls and physical checks will be much much lower. Um, than for a load that is not UKIMS. Um, it won't be very much. I mean, it's not. I'm not talking about you know huge percentages of checks. We, these are very tiny percentages of checks anyway. But you you will potentially be subject to that because obviously that it's not possible to know um, a, a truck that's carrying both things. You know which thing is going where at the point it goes across, uh, and uh, from a from a the standpoint of the uh, authorities. Yeah. Um, that's the only difference, but but otherwise the um the the process should be should not be affected by the Should, fact shouldn't be. Loaded. Um, we'll stay on trucks, uh, Shanker. Sorry, William. A lot of these questions are Shanker questions, but we're going to stick with trucks. As a freight forwarder, Maddy Garner says, as a freight forwarder, we've previously provided the TSS clearance into NI for their customers, and that's worked great. Uh, now they've been refused UKIMS as we are not a trader. They're for if we need to facilitate the movement, we're having a lot, uh, having to look at full frontier declarations. Is there a, another option for Maddie? Because I'm sure the intention was not yeah. to disrupt the intermediary market here that keeps the. No. no, and we did, I mean, on TSS, we do allow intermediaries to have their own accounts on behalf of other traders. And the intention was to make sure that they could continue to do. Uh, the things that they were doing for their traders, and that um, I know there was a conversation about UKIMS for for hauliers, and particular particularly for um, essentially logistic service providers. Hmm. What what I suggest on that one is, if um, um, if Marie would like to get in touch with me, um, uh, you will have my my email. Um, yeah, Maddie, we'll we'll pick that up with uh, Maddie Garner. Yeah, uh, uh, Heidi will be taking copious notes. My colleague Heidi, who's yeah. uh, as you can see, what? and we'll we'll make sure we circle back because actually uh, I've heard this from the, other. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I'd yeah. like to I'd like to sort of understand how the Yukon's process worked for her because um, I think there's some help that we could give her. Good. There, oh. Um, to to make sure, and there may be ways around this in terms of the traders, uh, you know, Eori number and. And, and so on. Um, yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm going to turn now to Andrew Hale, who has got a, a, a question I think will apply to a number of businesses who, um, due to the, the, the way that they process their goods and, and, and manufacture, uh, they have, <clears throat> excuse me, in, uh, these are intermediate goods uh, for Northern Ireland manufacturing, which, which move more than once. They don't go one way 
and get processed and completed. They go to NI manufacturing as raw materials. They get processed into a different state. They then move back into GB to be processed into a different state and then go back to NI. Um, what, what's the process for that? Is, is, is it, uh, they don't all, and also when they finish the product, they don't know the final destination. So I think his point is the goods are moving back and forth. Yeah. And they don't know at the point that they return to, they come to NI where they, whether they're going to result in moving to the Republic of Ireland uh, or via the Republic of Ireland into the, the EU single market or not. Um, is it just got to keep yeah. processing the, uh, uh, using UKIMS uh, constantly for each move? Um, so, that's a very fact specific one. So, so again, what would make sense, I think, is for us to have an offline conversation to sort of understand exactly what the process is, because obviously you can now UKIMS, use UKIMS for goods that are going, you know, one stage removed from the actual processing. But um, it, 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 it maybe there are other customs processes actually that would be better and more suitable um, for him to use customers, other customers, special procedures that might actually make this an easier thing to uh to do um i'm not sure i mean given that he's in the republic of ireland and part of the uk you wouldn't typically need to use inward and outward processing for example for goods moving within uh, our own market would you no well um but there there are cases where you would would want to do that if there's an at-risk component to them, and that's the and we don't know the that's, and, that, of and, that, and, that, and that, yeah. that's the problem here is that that there is an at-risk component to where the goods ultimately end up. So okay. there may be ways of of dealing with this. Um, um, I, think, I think it's a great question, though, Shankar. Yeah. Because we do know that you know things like food product, you know, milk that becomes yeah. quiche, becomes a a quiche that becomes a, a ready meal uh, kind of thing. Uh, you know that there are uh, supply chains that operate in that way between NI and yeah. uh, Scotland and England and, and so on. So. And the type of goods it does matter quite a lot because, with regard to the processing exceptions, um, obviously food. Um, uh, certain healthcare products i mean other other things you know, particular things that are used in construction for example do get processing exemptions yes um that you have to be able to prove the 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 destination that may be the issue that here, may be but, the issue here which is um, not knowing the ultimate destination yeah. or, andrew we're going to circle back to you uh, uh, uh on on that question but i do think there's a general uh, piece in there as well, uh, albeit that it depends on the goods and whether you know the final destination. And just you mentioned control uh, control goods. Uh, Claire Nicholas also asked, uh, will control goods require further information? Uh, and if so, what's the scope and what will be required? Uh, to you, I think the context is to use UKIMS. Yeah. So is UKIMS fine for control goods? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no extra requirement um, for UKIMS, but to use the special process and and how the special how the simplified process will actually work for controlled goods, there will be additional information that is required in the process itself, um, and um, that is again that's why the traded goods profile exists to ensure that um, that information is um, downloaded onto the, the traders traded goods profile so that they can easily fill um, what needs to be filled in. Uh, but there will be more to be filled in for, yeah. um, uh, for that. This is another area where if it's food, um, the so SPS controlled goods, for example, um, if you are both on the NERM scheme and the UKIM um, system or the UKIM, UKIM scheme, um, then there are sort of additional advantages. Um, so for example, um, it's it's an it's a, it, if you're on the NERMS and the UKIMS, it's a six-digit commodity code, uh, as opposed to a eight-digit commodity code. Um, so um, that is again, there are there are simplifications all along the way, uh, and the way these schemes interact with with each other is quite important. So um, I would you, you need to look at these things in the round. So if you're moving food in that way, SPS controlled goods in that way, think about whether you should be on NERMS. If you are eligible for NERMS, then you need to, both the supplier and the receiver need to be registered, and there are various requirements for, for NERMS that need to be um, complied with. But that might help you with the ease of your customs um, you know, process. 
Okay. Um, I, I think it, I'm also uh, conscious there's a, a, a lot of abbreviations being used in this. Yes, call. I yes. think we'll 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 get a a, 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 a glossary for this <laughs> webinar, Shankar. Yeah. Uh, yes. for people with uh, appropriate uh, links uh, as well. Uh, also, uh, Emma Shaw uh, had hoped that you would answer that previous question on the freight forwarders and wants to be included in the circling back. So yes. capture that, uh, Emma, and we will definitely uh, do, do that. Uh, um, and uh, let, let me go to, there were some quick fire questions up here that I didn't get to earlier. One from uh, a colleague, Lorraine Holt, up in Hull and Humber Chamber, who asked a really reasonable question. How long does it take to register on UKIMS? So um, it, it varies. It's supposed to be a, uh, a relatively quick process. Um, we're talking sort of a few weeks um, to, 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 from application to being told you're a UKIMS registered trader. Um, if you're having trouble with it and it's taking longer, um, uh, than it should, then um, by all means, get in touch with us. I would also say get in touch with us before, you know, when you make the application, because the the quality of the application and how, you know, how well you answer the questions will partly determine how long it takes to get through the process. Absolutely. Good. Now, we're out of time. So I'll say to Rob, Olga, David, Emma, Mabel, Carolina, John, Ian, Yen, uh, Alison, Joanne, Wendy, and Neve. Um, we've got your questions, uh, we've logged them, and we will come back to you on uh, those questions. It just leaves for me to thank Shankar and William for their participation today uh, to uh, not only uh, be promoting the TSS and the uh, support that Shankar has offered today, but also remembering your chambers of commerce around the country all have people in them who understand how trade is done and can help. Uh, and if they don't know, then typically William, myself and our colleagues uh, can help them to find the answers or navigate you to where the answer can be found. Also, Chamber Customs up here. Uh, um, if you go to that website, there's also an inquiry form for any uh, other questions you have. There's some uh, other tools on there that uh, may be useful to you. Uh, and also, if you need a bit more deep dive and advisory uh, services, then we can help you with that too. So thank you very much for your atten uh, attention today and for your attendance. We'll be in touch with the feedback, the slides, and also the recording uh, and news of the next webinar uh, opportunity to work with us, which will be on CBAM, date to be uh, sent out soon. So thank you very much and good day to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.